Uh, our goal at the center is to become an international leader in research that affects liberty enhancing public policy and increases public and academic awareness of the history and philosophy of economics, economic liberty in particular, uh, fusing academic research with policy engagement, engaging globally to transform uh, society, but leveraging our position in the uh, Southwest, not Washington, D.C., but the Southwest of the United States, um, in order to, to do that. <clears throat> Today is the uh, fulfillment of about a 10-year-old dream for me to produce a report that takes the World Bank, sitting over there a couple blocks away, uh, doing business report that they do for the, the world uh, to build a North American-centric version of that report, which provides objective measures of policy features and governance features in the environment within which small and medium-sized businesses operate in jurisdictions across North America. I want to thank the center's team, and especially Steve Slavinsky, who you're gonna hear from in a few minutes, and Paul Bernert, um, who is? Downstairs, uh, at the desk. Well, Paul, uh, <laughs> who are largely responsible for the report and for making that dream a reality. It was an amazing thing as the, the director of a center to come in say, is this an idea we could possibly sort of engage and do and um, have it sort of happen, <laughs> come to life? Uh, and my actually having nothing to do with it <laughs> other than saying, well, that sounds great. <laughs> great, keep going. <laughs> so um, the ease of doing business in a specific locale, as you saw in this, is affected by the rules in that jurisdiction. Rules often serve good purposes. It's not that we don't have rules. They need to serve good purposes. The, the ease of doing business, especially for new small and medium-sized businesses, is eased if the rules are few and clear. The first edition of Doing Business North America report is the beginning of a program at the center for providing objective measures of the rule in place throughout North America. The ease of doing business overall score which combines the score each jurisdiction receives on six separate categories, is measured on a 100-point scale. A city that received a 100 on the ease of doing business, which is the overall score, would therefore have placed first on every single one of the six categories. Yeah. No city accomplished that task. The city with the highest combined score for the ease of doing business report, that is the highest ranked city, is Oklahoma City, which is featured right over here in the background in the, the panel. And um, with a score of approximately 85 out of 100. Local cities here, you see Arlington and where's the Washington, Washington. DC? Oh, behind there, that's why I can't see it. Um, um, Arlington ranked second overall, okay, placing first in the category of employing workers and well enough on the others to get a second rank. Washington, D.C. came in in the middle of the pack, 65th overall out of 115 cities, with middling results in each category. Washington basically is in the middle and always in the middle on every single category. Um, so that was sort of. <clears throat> I wanted to mention a couple things about this evening's event. Um, and one is that, uh, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, our, we had a, a speaker from the World Bank connected to the Doing Business report who was going to be speaking, and we found out at the beginning of the week, the very beginning of this week, that he is traveling internationally and is unavailable to be here, and we were not able to get a quick replacement, and we decided we wouldn't try to do a quick replacement because that would not necessarily be a, a good idea. But I also wanted to mention that we had also planned on having here our partner from Mexico, uh, Jose Tora, who is the uh, director for Caminos de la Libertad, 
uh, which is the organization that works with the Economic Freedom of North America report and also worked with us to collect the data for Mexico for this project, for which we're very appreciative and um, are uh, working with him um, to increase their participation in our project over the next two years. Um, Jose um, was going to come and um, it seems that there's a reason why it might be difficult to get into Washington right now on planes uh, because of some, I don't know, some national pastime that seems to be interfering with uh, um, attending events like this, uh, the World Series. Um, so um, I also want to say that the, um, the center, as I uh, mentioned uh, a bit earlier, is a joint endeavor of two entities at Arizona State University. Um, I wish to thank Paul Carice of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership and Amy Hillman, who's the Dean of the W.P. Carey School of Business for their support. Amy was instrumental in obtaining funding from generous donors for the students who collected the data. Paul is here today to speak next. So I'm gonna introduce him now. Paul is the founding director of Skettle. He received his bachelor's degree from Middlebury College where he was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship and quite wisely, he went, going to Oxford, he um, studied uh, PPE, wisely in my book, and then uh, stayed at Oxford also for um, a master's in the study of theology. After completing a PhD in political science at Boston College, he joined the faculty of the Air Force Academy where he taught for two decades before being invited to come and direct the uh, School for Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University. <clears throat> As the director of, of the center, uh, the school, Skettle, Paul has sought to counter the incivility of human public discourse today both through the public programs that Skettle has run and participation in other programs like uh, the program that's developing at North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and um, also one that he's doing tomorrow right here in this building. Is it in this space? In this room. So tomorrow night there's going to be a, yeah, uh, an, a, a, uh, um, an event here um, about um, the norms of civic disagreement. And so, uh, Paul, I'll Great. introduce Paul to come. Thank speak. you, Ross. Congratulations. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome to all of you. It's great to see this turnout. Um, thank you, Ross, for that very generous introduction. I'll borrow a line I first heard George Will use after hearing such a, a warm introduction that not all forms of inflation are painful. <laughs> some, are, some are pleasant. I bring greetings from the leadership of Arizona State University. That would be our very dynamic and innovative president, Michael Crow. Arizona State has been ranked for five years in a row by US News and World Report as the most innovative university in the country. And Michael will never let you forget that. Uh, but it's greatly to his credit, um, this school, uh, which has two centers within it, Center for the Study of Economic Liberty and the Center for Political Thought and Leadership, is another mark of Michael's spirit of innovation. It was, a, it was an innovation from the state legislature to make some space at Arizona State University on the flagship campus in Tempe to have discussions about preparing young people to be American citizens, citizens for the 21st century, through a better understanding of classic ideas about politics, the origins of liberal democracy, the origins of markets, and economic liberty, all as preparation for leadership in the public sector, the private sector, or however the students wanted to define that. So Michael has been, Michael Crow has been involved with this school and the rebirth of this Center for the Study of Economic Liberty since uh, the inception of the school in 2016 and, and our first real year in 2016, 2017. So greetings from the top of the university and from my dean, the dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Patrick Kenny, and as Ross mentioned, the dean of the W.P. Carey Business School, Amy Hillman. And just to give a, a bit of background history, it was those two deans who decided that the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty could be reborn, uh, have a second birth, 
Steve Slavinsky is here as the continuity of the center since it was founded in 2014. Um, but it was not in great shape when the school was founded in 2016, 2017. And uh, a crucial agreement between these two deans, Arts and Sciences and the Business School, was that we should find an excellent PhD in economics to be the new director of the center with a tenure home in, in my school department, which is in Arts and Sciences, with an affiliate appointment in economics. And this collaboration would revive the center and lo and behold, just as Ross said about the Doing Business North America report, what happened with the center once we found Ross and he agreed to come was poof. It just came roaring back to life because of ideas that Ross had, Steve still being there, building a new staff immediately, joining in, in all these efforts. So having welcomed all of you uh, and, and uh, thanking you for coming, now I turn to saying congratulations to Ross to Steve and Paul and Mason and Melissa and uh, other, other staff in the center for bringing this thing back to life and roaring back to life and just keep your eye on it uh, because it's, it's, uh, this is one of the first fruits but not the only fruit of, of the second you know, CSEL 2.0. Um, and I hope that we'll, you'll be able to see activities and programs in the center back here in the um, ASU Barrett and O'Connor Center. One more point about the Barrett and O'Connor Center. So this is uh, Barbara Barrett, uh, alum of Arizona State University, and her uh, husband, Craig Barrett, donating substantial money as they have to the Barrett Honors College at Arizona State University, and then to buying this building and refurbishing it. And then the other name, obviously, is uh, Justice Center Day O'Connor. Um, so this is a delightful space. Spread the word. Keep your eye on it. If you're, you're uh, I assume most of you locals, <laughs> uh, able able to travel for uh, programs and activities here. The McCain Institute is has its home base here, but there are other programs and, and a regular uh, set of activities and, and uh, programs. Uh, a, a bit about the school and the larger context. So we we are um, a peculiar academic unit, a school at Arizona State University can mean an interdisciplinary department. So it's, uh, it's gracious of Ross to have me speak as a political scientist. Um, they will bring out a large hook in a few minutes to get the political scientists out of here and make more space for the economists. Uh, but we, we are an interdisciplinary unit of uh, PhD faculty in political science, history, American studies, economics, uh, offering undergraduate students and now master's students uh, an intellectual program it's, it's based on, as, as Ross mentioned, the, the concept of PPE, philosophy, politics, economics, that the British Empire uh, developed as a way to prepare citizens to lead and serve in whatever dimensions uh, of life, civil society, uh, public affairs that they uh, would choose after their undergraduate education. So we offer this interdisciplinary curriculum in civic thought, American political thought, economic thought, and a, a, a curricular track on, on leadership and thinking about public affairs and leadership in um, civil society. Two centers that I mentioned are, offer experiences for faculty, for research faculty, for students, for public outreach, uh, this kind of project uh, to connect an academic unit with public policy issues. Our Center for Political Thought and Leadership does that mostly by uh, work in civic education. So our Center for Political Thought and Leadership in the school just received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of a team with Harvard, Tufts, and iCivics in Massachusetts to do a, a nationwide study of US history and civics education. So that's a project for the other center, uh, but, but also for the school. Uh, as the as the department head over this extraordinary center in its, its second birth um, and this particular project, it fits th this research project about economic liberty and, and conditions, including constitutional order rule of law conditions for doing business, fits into the larger project we have, which is to introduce in the university, a major university, uh, discussion and debate and educational opportunities about what Ross calls constitutional political economy. Constitutionalism and the rule of law generally, 
of course, the political science part of it is the most important part, but there is a sub part here for the, Ross left, um, <laughs> for the economists and, and for the political economy uh, part of it, it's, it. It fits into the larger experiences we want to give to the students. So among the points of congratulations to Steve and to Paul heading up the project, writing the report, is how they incorporated students as, as uh, research uh, experience for the students, but they, from what I hear, they actually did good research, <laughs> important research. They couldn't, Paul and, and Steve couldn't have done it uh, uh, without them, which is a, just a great experience for these undergraduate uh, students, some of whom are students and majors in, in our school, civic and economic thought and leadership, and, and some from other parts of, uh, of ASU. Uh, let me just finish by making a large point, since we are in Washington, D.C., uh, the, the larger civic importance, political importance of what the center is doing, this particular research project, but also the discourse they are reintroducing into Arizona State University about political economy, history of economic thought, the intersection of philosophy, politics, economics. So Ross didn't tell you, the center, and you could find material on the, on the table here, they have a, a, a research workshop philosophy, politics, and economics, bringing speakers from the four campuses of Arizona State University, speakers from beyond uh, the university in the Phoenix area uh, to present papers. It's an interdisciplinary seminar, multiple uh, disciplines coming, not only economics. They have a speaker series in the center, a uh, terrific list of speakers coming in. There's so much going on, I can't begin to attend all the different <laughs> public events that the center is, is doing already. So that all of that brings discourse, ferment, uh, civil debate within the university, with the business school, beyond the business school, for, for students, for graduate students, for the broader community, about these crucial issues for the 21st century global economy and for America's political economy and for American politics. One, one thing we know about surveys of young students is they don't really understand or appreciate a, a market economy and principles of economic liberty. They hear about the bad side of it. They take for granted uh, all, all the opportunities and, and the good side of it. And they're not really equipped to think and debate. Uh, and and uh, they are somewhat easily seduced uh, by, by slogans and, and easy answers and, and uh, formulas. Some of that is on the right side of the intellectual and political spectrum. And, and a lot of it is on the left side of the intellectual and political spectrum. And so the, the existence of the center is, is, is changing that within the Arizona State University community, the Phoenix community, and I think it will spread um, beyond that. Uh, so here, here we are in the center of economic and policy centralization in Washington, D.C., uh, but, at, but ASU and at the ASU Center here in D.C., there's space to think about uh, that, and the, the DBNA is one uh, example of that. So uh, congratulations to the center, and I did want to mention Christian Kim is here. Uh, so one, one of the other achievements uh, for Ross and the center uh, is, to, is to build the research uh, staff and, and the faculty, and to, uh, Christian will be coming on board next year as the associate director of the center with a faculty appointment in the, in the business school. Um, I, I hope you will stay in touch with the center and find out about the website and get in information. Look for next year's iteration of the Doing Business North America uh, report. Learn a bit about the, uh, the school uh, as well. Um, that you'll get more information, but also continue to provide your interest and your uh, support for it. And with that, I'm asked to introduce uh, Steve Slavinsky. So as I mentioned, uh, Steve is the continuity of the center from its beginning in 2014 at Arizona State University. Went through a, a, a bit of a, a decline. There was a stall uh, within the business school. The school came along, the School for Civic and Economic Thought Leadership came along. We worked out this arrangement, but through it all was Steve. Uh, and now, with, under Ross's leadership, you know, Steve shows, has showed what he can do. I'll mention one other uh, uh, recent uh, achievement a project he's worked on for a long time about licensing requirements 
and license requirements in different states, and and the in, the inefficiency and in a way the unfairness, the the hurt, the obstacle to economic opportunity, with states having too many licensing requirements beyond what they even understand, and then and then the barriers across states. And so Arizona passed a piece of legislation recently. It's now state law, and, and I think Steve Steve's intellectual activity, research activity, had a hand in that to say that Arizona should recognize legitimate licensing requirements and, and uh, licenses from other states. You move into Arizona, you don't have to start all over again and the money and the time and uh, licenses. So uh, he, he came to the center from uh, different experiences with economic centers and research centers around the country. He helps us in, in the, the CSEL to be connected to other research institutes and, and thinkers about political economy and economic liberty in the, in the Phoenix area, including the Goldwater Institute and the, and the Free Enterprise Club. Uh, and congratulations for you know authoring support, leading uh, the project. So Steve Slutsky. Thank you. I'm very excited you guys are all here. I'm so glad we're finally able to share this with old friends and new. So thanks so much for coming out. Uh, what I want to do is walk you through part of the website. Now, there's a lot going on with the website, all the way from just getting a top level, 30,000 foot view of the project to drilling deep down in the way a data geek would love to do with what would I call the fire hose data sheet. We're not gonna go that far today, but I'm gonna give you the top line stuff so you can get a sense of what the project can offer. And I also wanna make sure I underscore the fact that this was truly a collaborative effort. Ross was, was the broad inspiration. He helped Paul and I kind of put together and gave us the freedom to do what we needed to do to get the project done, but we could not have done it without the about 10 students or so that we had over the year-long project. And this was a year-long project. And literally, if these students were not studying for classes, because that was their first job, they were students, when they weren't studying or working on classes, they were working for us on this project. And so we actually had a little sort of paddock outside my office where they would come and congregate and do a lot of the research on this project. And so uh, we really could not have done it without them. And so now we can finally unveil to you what uh, this uh, truly is all about. Let me go ahead and just pop over. This is a little inelegant, but let's go ahead and just show you where we're at in terms of the website. This is the Doing Business North America website. Now, at the top, you'll see these rankings, data, reports, methodology. I could walk you through all of those, but I'll just talk you through kind of the top line stuff here. In this case, if you just tap on here, you could basically get the entire report in PDF form. That's a great thing if you don't want to carry around with you. But if you do want to carry around with you, we have multiple copies out here. And I would urge you, the more you bring, the less we have to bring back. But we want to make sure people have copies so they can use and give to their friends and family. Hey, it's holiday shopping season. Bring as many as you like. They're also a little hefty, so you know, keep that in mind. But it's good paper stock, and it's, it's a really well done design in terms of uh, graphic uh, intent. But here's where the interesting stuff happens on the website. Go along to the top here. You can hit rankings. OK, so let's see here what this looks like. Here's the city rankings. Of course, as we said, we had 115 cities. In fact, let me just give it back one more time here so you can see this of all of them. If you go down further, here's where we're at. 115 cities across 92 states and provinces, 63 data indicators. That basically means we had 63 broad measures of these uh, city regulatory burdens. I think the city regulatory burden aspect is actually one of the crucial parts of this project, and in fact, the thing that sets it apart from other what you might call economic freedom indices. And that is most of those will look at state level burdens, you know, licensing burdens uh, or tax burdens. We go down further because one thing that you might notice if you've worked at all in city government or observed it to any degree, you'll notice that a lot of the time, the city barriers, the city burdens, are far more excessive than the state level. A lot of times because what the state is doing is that they're providing sort of a foundational level and then cities are piling on top of them. We wanted to go ahead and measure those things because some cities, uh, say cities in Texas for instance, uh, might look like if you just looked at the, national, the state level that they're all doing great, but there's actually a lot of variation even within a state like Texas or Florida or California, as you might expect. And so effectively what we're doing is we're trying to drill down deeper and ask the question, how are cities doing relative to allowing businesses to set up and operate over the course of their life cycle? Oh, I must say one more thing. I, I didn't, uh, didn't go down far enough, as a matter of fact. Uh, we have six categories. Uh, this is all about why it's important. I think if you're in this room, you probably have a pretty good sense of why this kind of stuff is important, but we've laid it out here for you if you'd like as well. But here are the six categories, and they're going to be mimicked across the study in the graphic components you see across the room. Starting a business, that's just basically the number of steps it takes just to start your business. 
employing workers. These are the employer mandates. These are things like minimum wage or city required mandated sick and paid leave and things of that sort. Getting electricity, fairly self-explanatory, but not, it's not always easy to get electricity in certain places. And sometimes it's really quite expensive based upon the state laws uh, uh, legislating uh, certain types of ma mandates and regulations for electricity providers. Registering property is pretty important because if you can't register your property, you really can't prove ownership of it. But some states, or rather cities, make it harder than others. We wanted to gauge that, and that's what registering property is all about, paying taxes. Fairly self-explanatory, but again, we had to also include the fact that not only are we looking at state-level taxes, like income taxes, personal and corporate, we're also looking at local-level property taxes, which is, again, something a lot of the state uh, metrics don't often measure. And they're often sometimes the more onerous and most complex kinds of taxes that businesses are facing. But what if, through it all, after you've set your business up and you've hired your workers, what if happens you have to shut things down? Well, that's where insolvency comes in. And in most countries across the world, this is a lot harder to do than in the US or even in Canada and Mexico. But we did include this because we wanted to include the entire life cycle of a business in our categories. And that's exactly what we've done with these six. Here's where the fun starts, in my opinion. These are the rankings, the city rankings. So here's what we can do. We have all of this data, and we have all of these rankings. We've got all these cities. You may not be interested in every city. If you're like me, you knew nothing about Canada before this. I'm not so sure I really know as much more about Canada as I should, but the good news is you can drill deep in here. But we have all of the topics, or all of the cities. I want to go ahead and just do a quick walk you through sort of a quick real-time analysis here. I just want to look at Arlington. So you can type in ARL, and there's Arlington, Virginia, and so you get your, your first filter there. Then let's, go, let's do Washington, D.C. I don't mean Seattle, I mean Washington, D.C. There we go, we press apply. That long list has suddenly dropped down to two lists. Well, why is that important? First is, see this little logo here? You can actually download the Excel spreadsheet of all the data, right? Only the stuff that you filtered. So if you don't want it all, and I'll show you how to get it all if you really want that fire hose in a little bit. But here's what's interesting about this. This gives us an opportunity now to look at the comparative statistics. Ease of doing business. So these are ranks, second place, uh, Arlington and 65, as we already discovered. But why might that be the case? Well, where did Arlington score better than Washington, D.C.? Well, obviously, employing workers, there are fewer worker mandates, or I should say employer mandates, in Arlington, in Virginia generally, than there is in Washington, D.C. Uh, getting Registering property, much better in uh, Arlington there than it is in D.C. And of course, paying taxes. It's a lot easier to pay taxes because taxes are a lot lower in Virginia generally, in Arlington in particular, than it would be in Washington, D.C. What's interesting here is that it's not too different with that electricity. Again, not too surprising as you're right across the river from one another. But look at starting a business. Washington, D.C. actually scored a little better than Arlington, right? So what we're talking about here with the ease of doing business score is actually an aggregate across the six categories. Some cities are going to do better than others in different categories. So I can also imagine a world in which Washington DC City Council says, hey, we beat Arlington, Virginia in starting a business. Yes, but you also did much worse in registering property and in getting, uh, I'm sorry, in employing workers. So again, this is all gonna be cumulative over time. We're gonna do this every year. This is not the last time we're doing this. And in fact, we're gonna be adding more topics in future years in more cities as well. What I have on my wish list for the second edition of the study, which will come out around the same time, October of next year, and we already have our student workers, uh, all 10 of them, working uh, now adding new uh, data to our collection. We want to do something on local level occupational licensing. As far as I know, virtually no one has done anything on this, and we want to be the first, or one of the first. There's a few data sets that are floating out there. We want to be able to kind of cobble them together and put that together, because again, most of them are state level. We want to go down to the city level as well, because some of the city level regs are even worse than the state level regs. We also want to look at city land use zoning and, and land use restrictions. Uh, or, and I was talking to some of the folks in the Institute for Justice this morning, we might even go so far as to look for what you call space use restrictions. If you own your house and you have a home business, and a certain percentage of your home has to be devoted to the office in order to avoid certain types of tax penalties or regulatory penalties, that is a restriction on your property and your use of that property. And so we think having those types of use restrictions in, this metrics, uh, in these metrics could actually be uh, really very, very useful. So that's where we're going to see uh, some of the movement in the second edition. Uh, again, if you want all the methodology here, you can just go here. Uh, it's also in the report, but again, you, you click on this, it'll show you uh, exactly what we mean by this. Here's where the data fire hose comes in. This, I think the last thing I'll show you is basically there's the download all data, which is the big spreadsheet. It's a big spreadsheet, uh, but it's fun if you're a data geek like me and you want to uh, play around with it. 
But if you just want to see specific cities, again, you can just go right to different ones. Let's go ahead and do Arlington again. So here's your Arlington. You click it on. And here's where you get your data by city. These graphics look a lot like what you're seeing around the room here. We have an entire appendix for every city. And what they'll show you is your score, your rank, the cities around you. So in this case, Oklahoma City does the best. And then, of course, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Boise, Idaho. Uh, go down further in the list and rank uh, three and four. And then here's the ranks and scores. Here's where the data comes in. Right down here, these are the things we did. The number of procedures to start a business, the time and calendar days it takes, the cost of doing these things uh, as, as a ratio of uh, personal income. And then there's employing workers. You click on that, you get down further, here's the score. Here's what we're looking for. We're looking for annual minimum wage uh, relative to personal income. We're looking at uh, the maximum number of working days that are allowed per week for workers. These are uh, paid annual leave requirements for workers, things like that. These are city level mandates on employers that are going to increase the cost of doing business. And you have more of those burdens, you're going to increase the cost of doing business. And by, and by, by definition, you're going to have fewer businesses starting. And another thing, great thing about this project and allows us with this website, we are making this data available to anyone free of charge. It's all publicly available data, but we want to see what analysts, researchers, and scholars can do with this data. We want to send this out into the world and say, show us what we're doing well, show us what we can improve on, but show us how this relates to other types of metrics. Personal income growth, business starts, entrepreneurship, income mobility. These are important real world applications that I think can be uh, uh, illuminated by the data we're seeing here. And so please stay tuned, focus on the website. If there's stuff we're not doing well, feel, there's emails on the website, you can, or you can just email me. Some of you know my personal email, feel free to do that as well. But the point is we want to make this project as good as it could possibly be. And this is year one, and it's only going to get better from here. And we're very excited for what we have. So thanks for taking some time to listen to us tonight. Appreciate it. Have a good night. The Doing Business North America report was conceptualized and envisioned as a North America project, not just an American project, which where we were like, oh, maybe we should include our neighbors. Um, it was envisioned as a North American project. In the context of shared markets across Canada, Mexico, and the US, we can learn as much about the ease of doing business in Alberta as we can from the ease of doing business in Chiapas or Virginia. Notice I skipped up a step, not city to, to state or province, but um, the, you, you have each layer present here. The city level focus of the report actually highlights the effects of the different choices that Canada, Mexico, and the United States have made about governance between cities, states, and national structures. Of course, you know, many of us think immediately about minimum wage laws, right? because they've been in the news so frequently, and fair enough, but um, because not only national governments, but also state or provincial governments and city governments have created minimum wage laws. Uh, minimum wage laws are one of the places where Steve's comment about seeing how cities go farther, you know, so that you have a national minimum wage, and then you have a state minimum wage, and then you have a city level minimum wage. Um, all and everyone has to, each lower level of governance has to build, go up higher if it wants to um, quote unquote improve on um, its minimum wage law. Um, and um, so, so there's a lot of variation in that something like minimum wage laws, but that's only the start. Significantly different choices have been made in the three countries and even within states and provinces about who decides the kinds of regulations that are measured in the DBNA report. Provincial level decisions, for example, matter more in the Canadian provinces than they do in than the state level ones do in the US. And in Mexico, quite a few of the categories we, we measured are deeply centralized. You may have noticed um, that um, some of the cities, what's the category that, where we just did one, two, three, that's oh, resolving, insolvency. resolving insolvency and ended up that the uh, insolvency laws are, tend to be national in scope. So all cities in the US have basically the same insolvency laws and they're different than the ones in Canada and they're different than the ones in Mexico. And so that category only has three rankings. One, you're either US, Canadian, or Mexican. Um, <clears throat> that's just one example of some of the centralization in Mexico. Choices about, so one of the key issues that this report suggests to us is that choices about governance matter. Choices they ma matter not only about just what the level of a rule is, but also 
what level of governance makes the rules for a specific area. Right? Yet even within the varying importance of city, state, and central government decision making, cities also find ways to differentiate themselves to attract business. Despite ranking 63rd for employing workers and registering property, and 115th, which means dead last, okay, in getting electricity, the city of Winnipeg, Manitoba, the city in which I received my PhD, managed to rank first in the category of, for all of North America of starting a business, okay, requiring only two steps that take only four days to complete with almost no cost. Now, any city that in the wintertime has a temperature that Arizona has in the summertime, except at the opposite end of the spectrum. Okay? I have lived at both, in Celsius terms, both plus 45 and negative 45. Okay? Um, you might expect, might need to be really generous in helping businesses start to operate in such an environment. Okay? That's Winnipeg. But the number two in the list is Halifax which is similarly a location nowhere near as cold, um, but uh, which also on the margins of North America needs to attract business so it makes it easier for people to start. So you can see how cities find ways to be, if you will, entrepreneurial in their attempts to change their governance structures in different ways to be able to create an uh, environment which is attractive to its business, um, to businesses. Looking forward, what's coming next, we, uh, um, Steve's already said a few things about this. We're, we're looking at various ways of incorporating more cities without making the DBNA list too, too long. Okay. The World Bank's doing a business report includes more categories, and we actually collected more data than we released in this report because of some of the issues around uh, the, the governance issues and, and straightening out the data. But as we are um, adding categories, we're doing that as we are confident that they actually contribute meaningful to the target of measuring North American variation. And we would continue, of course, to refine our, our process of data collection and data verification. Our job on the DBNA report for 2019 is done. But much remains for all of us and you to do in using the database to enrich our economic study of regulation, as well as to find ways the data can contribute to other research topics and policy challenges. Thank you very much for coming. And we look forward to interacting with you over the next year, years, about this report. So thank you very much for being here.